them up. We're going back into our study in the book of Acts. <clears throat> On the back of your bulletin, there is an outline. I seriously think that we will not get through all of this, but you're not surprised at that. Yeah, I see going, yeah, yeah, well, well what else is new? <clears throat> but that outline is there to help you kind of make sure that I stay on track and do this. Frankly, this passage of scripture, as I studied it, and then as I looked at how other Bible ex teachers dealt with this, <clears throat> It's uh, another one that's, that's challenging. It's like, okay, why did the Spirit of God have Luke put this in there? There's, there doesn't seem to be any real doctrinal truth that's here. Uh, it's, 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 it would be a very, on the surface, a very easy passage for us to go, what does this have to do with us? What does this have to do with me? Because it was just some stuff about the travel arrangements and some old guys back 2,000 years ago traveling around over in Europe and doing some things. Well, as, as I studied it more and, and looked at some of the things that were mentioned about this time period in other parts of the scripture, some very powerful truths began to be apparent. And I think they're timely <clears throat> in that um, the, w some of the trends right now in our, especially American church, is that there's things that are pulling people away from the local church. Now, I do understand, and I agree, that, that, that there's a lot of churches that are changing. The, the churches are, um, are diminishing. Uh, and I don't have any particular church in mind when I talk this way. I'm just saying it's pretty obvious that there's some trends out there. Some churches are becoming entertainment centers. They're doing things that they perceive to be what, what people will bring people to come. And they need to um, have a, everything is planned very carefully in their program to uh, appeal and to stimulate the church and some of those churches maybe go so far as to back off on their explanation of the word. They might mention some verses here and there and have some devotional thoughts, but very brief. But, but there, there's actually some seminars and some teaching that says whatever you do, here are the subjects and the words that you do not want to talk about. People will get upset, they'll get convicted, or they'll they'll not want to come. You'll make them uncomfortable. And so there's some deliberate maneuvering around certain topics and certain texts of the scripture. And, um, and then there's, a, there's the issue of tragedies. I have in the past asked for a show of hands of people present who have in the past witnessed disagreements and issues within a church family that basically shattered a church, have had leadership that failed, or um, people who were vying for control and power and things like that. And, and it's, it's been shameful, frankly. I have my home church. I was raised in my teenage, junior high, and high school years. And after, that church doesn't exist the same way. It was one of the strongest Bible-teaching churches in the area. And today it is not at all. And yet, <clears throat> Jesus said, I will build my church. He anticipated opposition. He said, and though the gates of hell will go against it, it will not, they will not prevail. But in this text, and this is why we have in, uh, given this particular passage of the word of God, <clears throat> The title, Greatly Loving the Church. We have, a, we have some evidence here that I hope the Lord will allow me 
to keep you with me to, as we step through this, to see how in the life of the Apostle Paul, the effects of his influence, not just in his generation, but we are affected today in another part of the world, 2,000 years later, by this man's 25, 30 years of how he served the Lord. How did that happen? Is there anything that we can learn from what God preserved in this portion of his word that would help us to be able to also govern and prioritize our values and our activities as individuals and as a church so that we would have an effect, a beneficial, powerful, God-glorifying effect upon the area or farther, even more than just this, this town or these little towns around Cedar or our county. Would that be too much to ask? Could God do that again? Has he ever done that before? And so there are many who today, and I'm hoping that if you've been tempted in this direction, frankly, I'll just be real upfront with you. As we look at this portion of the word of God, if we're tempted to diminish our devotion, our commitment to the local church, that we will see that that is not wise. We need, the church needs to stay on track. Christ needs to be the one governing and leading in the assembly. Leaders don't, shouldn't get in the way. We should be able to navigate through the opposition, which is sure to come. I mean, there's no church that skates through their, their existence without attacks, uh, whether they be doctrinal from the outside or internal or whatever. This we expect. It was in the New Testament, the pattern, and it's been that way ever since. It's still that way today. But here's the deal. How do we really have a dynamic, powerful, lasting, God-glorifying effect upon our world? Is that possible? There are people that have, <clears throat> in the past, I don't know if you've ever read the biography of a man by the name of Hudson Taylor. He was an individual that for some reason got focused on the needs of the continent of China. It's a huge country. Today, a hundred years later, after Hudson Taylor's life is long past, his effect upon the land of China is still felt. Amazing testimony. But the one that we're going to look at again in our study of this historic transition book of Acts is the former Pharisee, Christ hater, persecutor of the church. We're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul. And at this particular point in time, he has been serving for a number of years. I'll show you on a map in just a second. But consider this. Look at the advantages we have that he did not have. He lived in a day when travel was quite different than it is for us today. He had to either walk, ride a slow animal, or get on a ship. And, and it was treacherous. You, there are some of the spots in the text that we're going to look at today that it took him just to go 30 miles, took him all day long which is the same distance that a guy walking at a pretty good rate can walk 30 miles in a day. I couldn't, but it's possible. <laughs> but he had to walk pretty much most places he went. None of those things. He did not have the benefit of communication with the telephone or cell phone. If he wanted to talk to somebody in the town he was in, he had to go see them or send and have them come to him way more difficult just to have a conversation. We didn't have email, copy machines, other modern tools that make communication so much better. And he spent many of his years in prison or restricted in his movements. 
he had opposition from within these churches that occupied his time and his emotions. And he had fierce opposition from outside, from the, the, the Jewish leadership or from the Roman government later on. And it, I mean, it was, it was like dogs nipping at his heels all the time. This was another thing. And yet, we understand that his whole ministry career was probably only 25 to 30 years. But he left a dynamic and lasting impression an impact upon the world, the world at his, in his day, but not only in his day, today. And again, can that still happen? And if it does, how can we learn? What, what are the things, what, what could be gleaned from this particular 16 verses that we're going to look at? And, and we'll see the same things, I think, through the rest of the book, but... We're going to just focus on this right now on what, what are the principles from God that he preserved for us in his word that if we will learn them, apply them, and use them, that we will be more effective than maybe we could imagine. May I also say that if you happen to be an individual that because of some past experience, you would be tempted to pull away from the local church and kind of just do one of those things where you say, look, I'm just going to worship God on my own. I don't need the church. That will go against everything that we see in the example of the New Testament, frankly. Um, keep an open mind on that. How did he do it? <clears throat> now, I'm not suggesting that uh, God was the one that gets the credit. It wasn't just some uh, formula that we can apply and it's going to have the same, you know, the same kind of effects. And it was really God's sovereign working. God, you know, met him that day on the road to Damascus, changed his whole perspective, changed his priorities, changed his direction, and, uh, and sent him and then taught him and sent him out to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And I'm not suggesting that, 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 for sure, if we do these things, that there's going to be a whole bunch of Apostle Pauls with the same kind of effect. That's up to the Lord. If we're faithful to the Lord, we will get the results that he has for us. And we should be very, very happy to please him and serve him, whatever those results might, might be. But I want us to look at what the Bible says was his, the strategy and how you can affect the world and how you can... Strengthen a church, because church is what Jesus focused on. He said, I will build my church. I want to be part of that. I don't know about you, but I want to please my Lord that way. <clears throat> now, before we read the text, I want to also point out to you that Jesus, when he said that in Matthew 16, verse 18, he said, uh, you know, Peter had just given this confession. Other people thought Jesus was this or that. and he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking for the group, said, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And, and it was upon that truth, that fact that God, that Jesus spoke and said, it is that truth. I will build my church in the gates of Hades. The gates of hell will not be victorious. It will not prevail against that. Later on in writing, when Paul was under the Spirit's inspiration, was writing the epistle to the church at Ephesus, we call this book Ephesians. And in chapter 5, he was talking about how families in the Lord work best. And he was in this particular portion, and I just read this short time back. He, he talked about the role of husbands and wives, but in specific when he was talking about God's plan and God's role timelessly, generationally, no change. In any part of the world, no change. He said, husbands are to love their wives. And then he said this, the same way that Christ loves the church. And then it goes on to talk about how Christ loves the church. So what we have in that text for husbands to model their home devotion to their wife by is the fact that Jesus is in love. He's in love with his bride. 
He's in love with his church. Now, here's a key point. If we say we love Jesus, should we not love the same things he loves? Paul demonstrates that. He was so devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not surprising that we see in his experience and in the record of Scripture about his life and ministry that because he loved Jesus Christ, he devoted his life to loving the church that Jesus Christ died to purchase and lives to build. Paul was a firm, strong believer in devotion to the church that Jesus loves. It's demonstrated in, his, in other books that he wrote, his unrelenting commitment to the Lord's church. He says, when he's writing to the Philippian church, he says that they are his joy and crown in Philippians 4.1. When he's writing to the, to the Colossians, he says that he's had... Uh, 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 he tells of the great struggle that he has had on their behalf and nearby for those in Le the city of Laodicea. And he prays, he's, his devotion is seen in the words that he says, he prays that they would be knit together in love and attain to all that wealth that comes from a full knowledge of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> That's in Colossians 2, the first two verses. A really powerful passage that demonstrates this is when Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says again of them that they were his joy and crown. In the church that gave him so much struggle and emotional turmoil was the church at Corinth. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, after, or verse 28, after listing a long list, more, more understanding of the things that, that plagued Paul's ministry, all the difficulties and shipwrecks and imprisonments and beatings and on and on and on. He gets through that whole list, and after describing all of that, he says, <clears throat> you know, but apart from these external things, there's the daily pressure on me because I love or I'm concerned for all the churches. He just never wrote it off. Did Paul encounter disappointments in ministry? Yes. Did he encounter rejection from people he invested in? Yes. But to the very last breath of his life, he never changed his devotion to the local church. And I believe that that's a key to why he had such an impact in his life. All right, let's read the text. If you have your Bibles open, let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> I'll try to explain this and get as far as we can through it. Verse 1, it says, After the uproar had ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. And when he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. And there he spent three months. And when a plot was formed against him by the Jews, he was about to set sail for Syria, which is where Jerusalem is. He decided to return um, when, this, when he found out about this plot. He decided to return by going th back up through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater of Berea, the son of, of Pyrrhus, and by uh, Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. But these had gone on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. We sailed from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came to them at Troas within five days, and there we stayed seven days. Just sounds like basically right now, right? It just sounds like it's a travel, a travel blog. Ah, it gets good. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them. This is in the, with the believers in a house church in um, Troas. 
He began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. I love that phrase for some reason. <laughs> but Paul went down and fell upon him. And after embracing him, he said, do not be troubled for his life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken the bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. But we, going ahead to the ship, set sail for Assos, intending from there to take Paul on board, for so he had arranged it, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, he, he, we took him on board and went to Medellin, sailing from there. We arrived the following day opposite Chios, and the next day we crossed over to Samos, and the day following we came to Miletus. You don't know where any of those places are, do you? But Paul had decided to set sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. There's so much here. There's so much here. So, <clears throat> it just looks like, if, when you're reading this, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You went here, you went there. You... But let me give you some help. All right. Now, these places have different names than what they have currently, but they're still populated and they're still over there. <clears throat> and uh, there's some huge things that happen. So I'm going to put some arrows up here. Here's where Paul is in the beginning of this chapter. <clears throat> And when it says, after the uproar had ceased, if you were here last week, you know what that was about. That was <clears throat> the effects of the gospel, just real briefly. The effects of the gospel had gone out and had really scattered. All, see all that orange area around where that arrow city is? That's Asia or Asia Minor. And the gospel had been so powerful and so effective in the city of Ephesus <laughs> That it had gone out and the seven churches of Revelation, which are around that, they had all been started. People had been trained. That whole region had been affected so much so that the, the silversmiths union that made these idols or these things that people bought to worship the god um, Diana <coughs> um, or Artemis, they were... It was cutting into their profits. They weren't selling as much. But what do you know about that? An idol that is not being believed in as much. And they started a riot. They got together. They whipped everybody up and started a riot. And uh, I showed you last week the size of this stadium that seats like 25 to 30,000 people is a famous stadium. Still today, you can see the ruins of this stadium there in Ephesus. And it was filled with a riotous mob that went on and on and on and on. And, and Paul wanted to go in. He wanted to go talk to these people. And they said, oh, no, you stay right here. And he did not go in. But the Lord delivered him. The riot was calmed down. God preserved the, the, the people. No one was really hurt in that. And that's what's talked about in verse 1. After the uproar had ceased... Now, <clears throat> Paul had already intended in chapter 19, it had said earlier there that he was planning on going on to, um, he was planning on leaving Ephesus and taking the gospel and going on to other places. And I want to talk about that now. So the riot took place. He didn't know that was coming. But now the riots passed. And now he's getting ready to go again. He's getting ready, as it says there. He sent for the disciples. He exhorted them. He was going to take his leave of them. And he left to go. Oh, it doesn't show up too well. Upper left in the place called Macedonia. I put a circle up there. I should have put it in red or something. 
And that's where the church of Philippi, uh, Thessalonica, Berea, there were churches in that area. The text only says he left to go to Macedonia. And then it says in verse 2, and when he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation. That's all it says about it. You'd think, oh, nothing much happened. Wrong. The Apostle Paul, during that, he was there for a number of months. Several things happened. And by the way, they got there by going up, follow the red lines. And it's probably too small for you to see if you're sitting very far back. But you could look at the Bible maps at the back of your study Bible. And there's a place they keep going through this called Troas. There were Christians there where he's going to come back through Troas. That's where the guy falls out of the window. Oh, I'm going to have fun when I'm preaching on that one. <laughs> and, <clears throat> but Paul goes up, up to that area and he was anticipating meeting a young man by the name of Titus. There's a book of the New Testament named for Titus. He got a letter from Paul. And he thinks, thinks he's going to meet Titus there. And here we're about where Titus had been serving down in Corinth because he had written a really difficult letter to that church and he had not heard how well that was received. And boy, he was anxious to hear how that church was doing. Again, Paul loved the local church. He wasn't there. So Paul leaves and goes on up to Macedonia there at the far upper left, the yellowish area of that region. And that's where Titus was. And he hears the report. It's a good report. They received the, the letter um, and, they, and it was a good thing. So Paul, now, I should mention this earlier, the whole purpose, he wanted to go here to Jerusalem. That's the wrong direction, Paul. You're going opposite direction. You're going up to Macedonia. Then you're going to go down on the left to the green area, Achaia or Greece, what are you doing going there if you're headed over to Jerusalem? The, one of the things that Paul was doing is collecting funds from Christians throughout the empire where local churches had been planted that were needed desperately by the Christians in Jerusalem. They were starving to death. They were being persecuted. It was very tough times. And... They were Jewish Christian converts. The Gentiles were going, we want to help. And Paul is organizing an effort to collect money. And that's why there's a group of people going. He, was, he knows how to handle money. He does it where there's no accusation possible. And he's going to go up. He's going to collect funds in Macedonia. He's going to collect funds in Achaia. And then he was going to come down and deliver these with some other people down to Jerusalem. That's going to happen. But he doesn't waste time. When the text just says here that he left to go to Macedonia and he'd gone through those districts, given them much exhortation. Oh my goodness. For some reason, Luke left out some huge things that happened in those times when he was up in Macedonia. For instance, he wrote 2 Corinthians, one book of the Bible. 16 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. He wrote that while he was up there. So that was a big thing. And then we find out from uh, comparing scripture in Romans chapter 15, and it's not shown on this map, but if you've got Bible maps, if you went beyond Macedonia, way up in that area, there is a place that's called, uh, Elik, uh, where my, where's my notes? It's called uh, Elricum. It's another region like Macedonia with several cities. Paul went up there. This is the only reason we know he did is because of what he mentioned on the, the far reaches of where he traveled with the gospel. Went up there, saw people trust Christ, started little churches up that way, and then came down before he left Macedonia. But, um, he, boy, this guy was, was busy. And it says... In verse 2, note the words, when he had gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation. One of the key characteristics of biblical ministry that affects people for generations, affects the world, is teaching of the word of God. 
it, it, it's, it, he just, everywhere he went, he was doing this. There, throughout this text, there's evidence of him everywhere he went. He is giving them exhortation, teaching them from the word of God. Then in verse 2, it says he left there. He went to Greece. Now, Greece is down here in Achaia. That's where Athens is. And then there's this little, it, just uh, over there, it's Corinth. Is, that's in that region too. He spent winter there three months. It was from this place. It doesn't mention this here. But we know that while he was there on this trip, he wrote the magnificent gospel treatise we call the Book of Romans. And in both of these places, everywhere he went, he had told them ahead of time so it wouldn't be a last-minute, uh, unexpected thing. If you want to be part of this, we're collecting funds. We're going to take them. We're going to preserve them. And we're going to present them to, your, to the church in Jerusalem, to your brothers and sisters in Christ that you've never met. And he's collecting up the money and bringing people, representatives from each of these churches that will ultimately travel with him to Jerusalem to give those funds to them. Can you begin to see he's not a one-man guy? It's not about his personality. One of the things that makes Paul such a world-affecting, world-affective missionary for Jesus Christ is he didn't, he always planted a local church and followed up with repeated visits, letters, sent trained people to encourage them, work with them, everywhere he went. It was there in Corinth where he discovered, as the text says, that when he went to leave, he was going to get on, get on a ship and just travel by ship back to Jerusalem with all these funds that had been collected. He found out that there was some... Some, a plot by Jewish leaders against him. They probably were thinking, you know, we'll get him out on this ship, we'll be out in the ocean, and he will, whoops, go overboard. Anyway, he found out about it, and he said, yeah, I guess I'd better walk back to Macedonia. So he traveled a long distance, travels all the way back up to Macedonia, and... <clears throat> He, he gathers these people. He sends them on ahead. And, and by the way, note with me, again, that we're being detectives here. We're trying to not miss anything. The Spirit of God has every detail that we need, and we should we pick it up. In verse 5 of our chapter, did you pick up that all of a sudden the pronoun went from he to us? Did you catch that? Who is us? In verse 6, we sailed. Who is we? What does that indicate? Luke, Dr. Luke, author of the book of Acts. Evidently, the clues are that he had been left before in Philippi to help that church to teach and give leadership in the church of Philippi. Now Paul's back up in that region. Luke joins him and they, he goes with him down Back to Troas. And that's where we're going to pick up some of these things about the guy that fell asleep and all that. Now, I want to just talk about the, the big outline here is there are four things <clears throat> that are, we'll only cover a little bit of this today. But there are four aspects as we see the record here of Paul's ministry that are timeless, powerful, and significant for you and me today in how we serve the Lord. If we want maximum impact on the, for the longest period of time, for the most amount of people, we need to pick up on these aspects of, that will show us Paul's commitment to the local church. The first one. Oh. We're going to get to Miletus next week. The first one is his commitment to establish and strengthen local churches. <clears throat> and there are three 
things in this text that talk about features of these church meetings. And some of these you're going to go, yeah, what's the big deal? But, but the big deal is, is that people are beginning to play with this as if this is not, this is not important. This is not, we don't have to do some of these things uh, today. The first thing is that the church met on Sunday. And I want to just point out to you that uh, in verse 7 here, we get some 7 and following. We're going to pick up some of these principles in our first aspect of uh, demonstrating the importance of the local church and how much we should be devoted to it still. Is that uh, this is the very first time chronologically when it says that the church met on the first day of the week. There are other places that were written later, but um, Acts, uh, there's, I think some of them have to do with, um, oh, <clears throat> in Revelation and, and, uh, and 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It's going to talk about some of, of the fact that they met. But this is the earliest reference to the custom of the church gathering on the first day of the week. And some people have said, well, pastor, the first day of the week, um, this, the, the Jewish calendar reckoned a day from sundown in our way. of So the, first, the Jewish calendar would have said the first day of the week began Saturday night when the sun went down. You ever hear that before? Okay. And it ended the, the next day when the sun went down. It's from Saturday night to Sunday, what we'd call Sunday or first day of the week night. That whole thing is the first day of the week. Yeah, but the Romans didn't do that. And the text indicates they were using the Roman reckoning of weeks. And so they were meeting <clears throat> on really on Sunday, in this case, Sunday night. It's really, really Interesting. I'm going to put a guilt trip on you, I think, on this one. But they met on the first day of the week, and uh, it, as the Romans reckoned this. And what difference does it make? What difference does it make what day the church meets? First of all, hey, Christians should, could and should get together any time you can and want to. Right? There's no limit. But... The scripture is pretty important on saying, but the church needs to gather regularly on the first day of the week. That is important. And why? Because we are remembering, and you know this, we're remembering the most significant truth that our Savior rose again on this day. Every time we meet, this should be something that is in our minds and is a critically important thing. We're celebrating our God lives. Jesus Christ is alive and he's leading his church and providing for his church. Worship, Sunday worship of the church is an evidence of the testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, does it mean that this is the Christian Sabbath? The Christians must follow the Jewish law regarding Sabbath observance? Some people do take that that way. But I think we need to consider some points. And I don't believe that it really is the same thing. Um, the, I think the Sabbath was a shadow. It was a picture of what has now been fulfilled in Christ. And that Christ is the substance, not the shadow. He himself, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, he's called our Sabbath rest. Instead of having a day when, how many of you, when you were young, I'm not, this is not to trap you and I'm not being critical. I was raised this way. How many of you, when you were young, your parents, what, wherever this might have been, you couldn't do much on Sunday. It was limited. Can I just kind of see? Oh my goodness, wasn't it that way? I remember when my dad, who loved to fish, and he's a pastor, and it was a real difficult thing for him. He wanted to be with his family. He was busy most of the time, but people left us alone on Sundays, and he said, I wonder if we could rest by the lake. <laughs> After church, 
go fishing. My mama was from Arkansas. My mama and my daddy had a big discussion about that. And it didn't help that when we did go to Folsom Lake and dad was casting one of the, you know, when he was casting, the hook came and caught my brother in the ear and my mama. What do you think my mama said? See? <laughs> but let me just remind you that the Sabbath command is the only one of the Ten Commandments that is not specifically repeated in the New Testament. Paul warned Gentile churches about many things, but he never mentioned the concept of breaking the Sabbath. When the Jerusalem Council met in Acts chapter 15, they said certain things the Gentile churches should bear in mind because these Jewish brothers and sisters were not trying to really make it tough on them. But you know what? They never said anything about the big deal of the Sabbath in the Jerusalem Council. But there are some today, there's a church just down the street, and they believe that if you do not worship on Saturday, that you are accepting the mark of the beast, and that you are being, that, you, that we are false teachers, and that we, it's, it's a huge thing to them, and, and more. But I just thought, well, we ought to cover that a little bit. But... We should probably set aside in some ways, treat the Lord's day, the first day of the week, in a special way. It's the day for worship. Not that you can't worship any, day, any other day, but you want to make sure that you worship. And here's the big one. And I know that some of you aren't used to this, but gather together to worship. The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 10 of that book, <clears throat> do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. And then he added this, which we ought to really listen to. He said, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And the word the day talks about the time of judgment. As we get closer and closer, has it ever occurred to you that the world is starting to really look like it's fulfilling the prophecies of the end times? That ought to translate into we need each other more. We need to gather together. We need to lift each other up in prayer. We need to be together in growing around the scriptures. We need to, we need to not forsake. We need to not let the difficulties that do creep into churches. If anybody should have been fed up with the problems that Christians have in churches, it should have been the Apostle Paul. And he never abandoned his devotion to the Lord's local church. And so the church met on Sunday. And then this is important. And then the church met to worship the crucified and risen Lord. Listen, this is a challenge for us here. It's easy to slip into traditions and customs and just the way we do things. But whatever we do on this day, in this place, it needs to keep Jesus Christ front and center. If we're, no matter what portion of the word of God we're explaining, it needs to always push and promote our risen Jesus Christ as our leader, our Lord. That's it. Churches are not to be about, um, you know, catering to, oh, you poor people and, and making it all about the feel good, feel good. And, oh, we're just here to, you know, lift you up. Well, we hope we edify you and lift you up. But the best way to do that is to promote the master, the savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is so critical. And they did this in verse 7. It says that on the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread. Now the early church, <clears throat> it seems as if the early church broke bread or had a worshipful communion service basically every single week or more. I know that some, there may be some of you disagree with this and that's okay. But this is just a time to 
focus everything else aside. One thing that happens in a, in a correctly or uh, structured communion or breaking a bread service is it's about Christ. This do in remembrance, Jesus said, of what? Me. It should be about him. So I don't know that it's anathema, terrible. I mean, here I go. You're going to kick me out for saying something like this. But I don't think it's wrong to worship Christ. If you want to break bread at home and make it about that, fine. Just don't abandon your local church doing it. They met together on the first day of the week. They broke bread. I don't see anything that says you can't do it any other time. Maybe after there's a time when things are coming apart and you've got a struggle in your family or in your marriage, maybe one of the things you might do as you pull it back together is maybe dad should say, you know what, let's get together and let's worship the Lord and let's, let's break bread. That wouldn't hurt. But make sure it's about him. And thirdly, <clears throat> The church met, this is, this is critical, the church always met to be instructed from God's word. It is a shame, in my, in my view of scripture, it's a shame for churches to meet together and to not send their people home without understanding more clearly some portion of God's holy revealed word. It should not be that you're going on going, wasn't that a great music time? Well, that, that's great, but it should be that you're going, you know, I never understood that passage like that before. I, I never realized, I mean, there should be something that pulls you in and builds you up and equips each of us because of the explanation of Scripture. That's a strong point. For our church. We want this. Churches need to get back to that. Well, too bad. I'd love to play with this with you. We'll have to do it next week, but there's a lot of things. I mean, this poor young man. But I but I'll tell you what, I'm gonna whet your appetite. <clears throat> There's some, I never knew this before until studying this for this message. Three times in this passage, verse 7, 9, and 11, it uses a different word for what was being presented in that service, how they were presenting the Word of God. And it's really, really interesting to me. Come back next week, and I'll tell you why. It's a different word. I'll give you what they are. It says in verse 7, Paul began talking to them. What does that mean? In verse 9, as Paul kept on talking. In verse 11, when he had gone back up after the guy was resurrected and so forth, they, had a, they broke bread and had eaten, and, and he talked with them a long while until daybreak. What? It's the same Greek word, talked, talking, in all three of these verses. What was that? It's different than the word exhortation that's up in verses 1 and 2. What was this? Okay, that's one question. Did the guy die? Why did he fall asleep? Why were they there so late at night? <laughs> I'm trying to pull you back. <laughs> Did he really die? Was there a doctor in the house? It's, it's kind of thrilling to me. I, um, <clears throat> some of you know that Pam and I have been invited to, to go back to the church we served in this later at the end of July. We'll be there first part of August to, to the church in Hawaii that that we served in for nine years. I have some fond memories of times meeting with new Christians, but well, you're gonna love this, out at the beach, 
and the questions just kept coming. And the sun went down, and the questions kept coming. And we kept talking about the Lord and about his word and instructing, and the questions kept coming until the sun came up. Now, that's ministry. <laughs> if you're worried that next week I'm going to preach for four hours until somebody falls down and dies, I'm <laughs> not really planning to do that. Someone said, okay, pastor, you can preach that long, but you've got to be able to raise the dead. I honestly want you to take this home today. This is the key point. When it's all said and done and our life is over, will we have made an impact for Christ? And to do that, what's involved? What I see here again in this particular passage is that no matter where Paul went, people were led to the Lord. They were brought to Jesus, not to Paul. They, he, he always made Christ the first thing, but they were organized into local assemblies around Christ for instruction, discipleship, and outreach. And that's the way we've learned today. You impact the world for Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, Is it possible? Is it possible for us here in this little church by the freeway in Cedar City and Enoch to make a difference in our county, to affect the city, to affect our neighborhoods? Lord, is it possible for us to Make it so that long after we've passed away, should the Lord tarry, the next generation takes over this work. That the testimony and the outreach grows and grows and grows. Lord, no doubt there are people here that have been severely wounded, discouraged, tempted to give up on the church because it just seems like it's so weak. It's so diverted and distracted. Lord, all we want is just to be able to know that when we come before you, that there will be a smile and a well done, and that there will be people around us that are there because you used us. Lord, that's really our desire. Father, you, you really, in an in a unbelievable way, used this former Pharisee, Paul. There were so many men whose lives were affected, and they became leaders. And there were so many cities around the empire that, for generations, were affected because of his 25 or 30 years taking the gospel out from Jerusalem. Lord, is it possible? Could we be used that way? Lord, I pray today that you would send us home really thinking about that. Help us to be devoted to the same thing that Jesus is in love with. Father, help us to not allow sin and self to creep in and to ruin our testimony because we're more focused on our own comforts, our own way instead of yours. Father, we really want to make a difference for your glory. Help us. In Jesus we pray. Amen.